so thankful for versatile musicians for uh, Joe's we threw Joe on the on the uh, cajon because we're like we need something in this song and and I told Robert I'm like I don't have a bass player did you want to play bass and he's like yes I would love to play bass and man we got a talented group of people up here can you like can you like give it up come on so good so good all right, I haven't given you a farm story in a long time. You guys ready for a chicken story? All right, here we go. So I got back from Emmaus, and I was missing a chicken. I saw her, like, one day, and then I got COVID, and I was, like, down for the count for a little while, and I was, like, and I didn't see her for a while. And I'm, like, oh, shoot. That d stupid devil, like, you know, something came and got, you know, a fox. Or I'm thinking, oh, you know, and I, and. I take my job as a chicken mama really serious. Uh, I, I I need to keep them keep them safe and but they're they're free range, so there's a lot that can happen. Anyway, a couple weeks go by and I'm thinking, I wonder if she might be laying on eggs somewhere. And I started looking under things and in my garage, and uh, after a couple of days, I found her. I found her because. It started stinking underneath my my porch. So what ended up happening is one of those eggs that she was sitting on exploded, and uh, it smelled like a dead animal under my <laughs> under my porch. And I'm like, oh man! So I look under there, and there she is. She's alive, but she's under my porch, and she's sitting on eggs. And I'm like, I bet she's sitting on like a dozen eggs. I better get the brooder out. I better get because I'm going to have chicks. And I started counting the days because I knew when I lost her. And uh, and then that smell came back. And I'm like, what? I, I had to pry up several of my my steps um, and move her and look at what was under her. There's three eggs at this point um, because two had burst. The next few days, two more burst, and it stunk. It stunk so bad at my house. So finally, I'm like, I'm moving you out, girl. I'm sorry. She was so mad. And I got thinking, number one, I was so relieved that my chicken didn't die and it wasn't my fault. Um, but I started thinking, I'm like, what, do, what am I incubating? What am I, what am I sitting on? When I tried to pick her up, she attacked me. She did not want to come off that nest. She was she was going to protect that those eggs, even though they weren't even fertilized. None of them. What are you incubating? Because we can put our focus on things that aren't that are that are dead, <laughs> that are just going to explode and they're not worth anything. Or we can be incubating something that's actually fertilized. I actually thought about it. I'm like, now how, I, I was wondering, I'm like, if they're not incubated, how long is she going to sit there? Well, ans that answered my question because I'm thinking um, God designed it so that either it was going to hatch or it exploded, <laughs> right? How cool is that? Let's continue to worship because God is such a good God. And I want you to think about what you're what you're incubating. What are the things that you what are the things that are important to you? What are the what are the things that are that take your focus? And are they are they things that are just <laughs> gonna stink <laughs> in a little while? Because they're not the things that are fertilized, the things that are from God. So as we worship, let's continue to just think about that. Oh, man. 
Jesus, we just want to thank you. You are so good. You're a good father. You work everything to for our good, for your good. <coughs> we just want to praise you.
Father God, we thank you for this time that we have together. Lord, we lift our praise and our worship and our lives up to you. We ask that you bring your spirit down to dwell within us and to give us the wholeness that we are all missing. Lord, we thank you. We honor you and we praise your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Take off high, have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire. Come on, church. Take off high, have in these hands. Multiply, God, all that I am, and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. Here I am, God, arms wide open. Glory
Jesus, we just want to thank you. We are gracefully broken. There's not a perfect person in this room. <laughs> we're all sinners and we're all saved by grace. Well, I thank you for your grace. I want to thank you for your love. And even when, when we stumble, Lord, you're there to pick us up. Lord, I pray for your blessing over this church. And I pray for your anointing over our pastor. I pray that you would pour out your spirit on him and over us, Lord. We need a word from you. We just want to love you more. That's why we're here. To give you honor and glory. So, Lord, use this time to pierce our hearts and our souls. And I pray that you would use us for your glory. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. I hope that worked. <laughs> uh, good morning, church. I didn't hear you. All right, there you are. I, I just wonder if I'd already put you to sleep or not. You know, Kelly did a great job. We do really have a lot of talented people up here. You know, I, I really appreciate all this time. But you, did you notice that she said that once I left? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I know I can't sing. I can't play any of those instruments either. I, I, I praise God that he gives those gifts to others. Well, this morning we're continuing to talk about hope, okay? I'm, I'm continuing to talk about hope. Now, last week, what we did was we explored the, the passages uh, of Scripture that were within the readings of the Psalms. And I don't know if you went home and read the book of Psalms or not. I, I doubt it. But if you did, the book of Psalms really describes the ebb and flow of life. If, if you read it, it, it really talks about the ebb and flow of life. And, and when we were talking about that, I said that there was a gentleman by the name of Walter uh, Brueggemann. Now, Walter Brueggemann is a renowned biblical theologian, and he published works where he compared the Psalms to that of the life's rhythm, life's ebb and flow. And he had a name for that, and what he named it, he named it these three items. He called them orientation, which is order. That's when our lives is in order. There's, there's nothing really uh, struggles. That life is good. I believe that's the way I described it last week. Life is good. Everything's going well. Then he described that we don't stay in that phase. Our life moves to a stage that's called disorientation, which is disorder. This is when we face struggles, when we face things in our life that disrupt the order of life, if you would, okay? And, and, and then we come through that, and we work through that if you read through the Psalms. We come through the other side, which is called reorientation. Now, you know as well as I do that we never can go back to the way things were, do we? Never. What we do is we evolve and we change to a new order of things, okay? A reorder of things, okay? So those are the three items that I want you to uh, see. And the purpose of understanding these rhythms of life uh, is that grasp the importance of hope is to grasp the importance of hope and what it plays in our life in navigating us and sustaining us through these rhythms of life and through these periods of life. Okay, now from here on out, what I'm going to call them, I'm going to call it order, disorder, and then a reorder or a, something new, okay? So I want to start off again by the just uh, uh, going back over the definitions that we use for hope. The first was a noun that says it is the conviction that despite one's present circumstances, that the future will in some meaningful sense be better than the present. Now, this is not to say that it will be what we expect it to be, but in some meaningful sense, it will be better than before, the present. Now, the second definition is a verb, and it's in choosing to believe, okay, Choosing to believe and to act as if the future will be better than the present. Now, those are the two definitions we're going to. Now, what is the opposite of hope? Despair. Despair. Absolutely. And that's where choosing to believe or act as if the future will be as bad, if not worse, than the present. 
Now, folks, we are human beings, and we've been given free will. We can choose to either have hope that things will approve, or we can choose, you know what, there's no hope. And we can live in despair. Okay? That's what we have. You know, in a world, in the world that we live in, I shared with you last week that there's no real true hope in the world that we live in. Okay? The world is continually to grow wickeder and wickeder and wickeder. That's the way it is. That's the way it's been since the beginning of time. Okay? But we as Christians, we have hope for a better future, for a better time. Then he say, Behold, I am making all things new. So we who are grounded, our faith is grounded in Christ, we can trust that the hope that we have is for a better day that will come to pass. And we need to hold on to that. And it is through the Scriptures that gives us the strength to hold on to that hope when we're struggling. So this morning, what we're going to take a look at is we're going to move into the New Testament. We're going to actually move into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? And we're going to look at the life and the teachings of Jesus, and we're going to see through those teachings and the life of Jesus we, where we can find hope that will sustain us through life, okay? Now, as Christians, we proclaim that Jesus was born into our world to what? To bring us hope into the world. Hope into the world, okay? So, with that premise, I did a little Google search. And I Googled the word hope. How many times the word is hope is used in the four Gospels? Anybody want to take a guess? 365. Well, that's better. They said a thousand. They said a thousand in my first service. <laughs> you know, actually, the word hope is mentioned twice in the North American Standard version of the Bible. Twice, okay, and it's only mentioned one time in the King James version. The word hope. Is mentioned in Matthew, the 12th chapter, the 41st verse, and it's mentioned again in uh, John, the 5th chapter, and the 45th. The only time in the gospel. I found that amazing. I don't know about you. Because if Jesus is the one that brings hope into the world, why is the word not mentioned more often? And the reason it's not mentioned is that Jesus embodied in his life and in his teachings what hope was to us. Yeah, yeah. That's what we need to understand. Look at the uh, Gospel of John. It says in the Gospel of John, it says these words. It says, What has come into being in him was life. Now that's hope. And the life was the light of all people. People living in darkness. Light is hope, isn't it? And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome that. Coming. Now that's hope. Okay? So to me, this clearly reveals that Jesus brings hope to our world, to our fallen world. Now, while Jesus may not have used the word, his teachings and the life of Jesus embodied hope such that he gave hope to others. And that's what we're going to look like. We're going to look at the hope that he gave to others by what he says and does. Okay? So we're going to examine what that looks like. Now, I said. We have life in order, and we have disorder, and we have reorder. So what does life in order look like? Let's start at the beginning. What does a life that's in perfect order look like, especially for Christians? Let's look at it from a Christian standpoint. Well, I want you to know that Jesus shows us and tells us exactly what a life that is in order looks like, okay? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. And as he's te- talking about the kingdom of God, a lawyer stands up and, and he asks him, he says, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, <coughs> You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your, um, all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He says, This is the greatest. Number one. And then he said to him, He said, The second is like it that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. 
Okay, so what does an ordered life look like? It's God, neighbor, and self. Everybody got an ordered life? Everybody's life in order? Everybody keep God number one in their life. And, and you place neighbor, you love your neighbor as yourself. No, we don't. We don't, do we? Now, Jesus says, if we have an ordered life, this is what it's like. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. It says, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Okay? Jesus says, you got your life in order. That's the way it is. God first. God is our rock. God is our foundation. Now, now what I want you to notice, and leave that up there just for a minute, notice, okay, that this house, the rain still falls, the floods still come, and the wind still blows. Okay? It doesn't say that it was exempt of that because it was built on the rock, but it was there, and because it was built on the rock, it stood. It stood, okay? Now, the Bible also says, reveals the human condition. Jesus tells the human condition. When we fail to maintain order for our lives, and here's what it says. It says, everyone who hears this word of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Okay? Great is the fall. The fall from order to disorder. Order to disorder. Disorder takes place in our life when anything comes before God. That's what Paul says. Paul says that uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, that is why we need Jesus. People say, well, why do we need Jesus? That's why we need Jesus. Because we keep failing. And we need His forgiveness. We need His forgiveness. Now, when you read through the passages, uh, 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 through the Gospels, what you discover is, that Jesus spends the majority of his time in those whose life is in disorder. That's where he spends most of his time because that, folks, is where we spend a majority of our time in disorder for our life, okay? Now, if you go back in the Gospels and begin to read, what do you find the Pharisees are always, uh, uh, always claiming that Jesus is eating with who? Tax collectors and sinners. That's what it says. He's always eating with tax collectors and sinners. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but we're going to take a look at that and, and see about these two because we fall in these categories of either tax collectors and sinners. We as human beings, okay? So I want to grasp an understanding of the tax collectors. The tax collectors, do you know they were Jewish people? They were people that would tell you that I believe in God. They believed in one God. But they had made a choice for their life. They had made a choice to collect taxes for the Roman government. They had made decisions that made them an outcast of their people. They had made decisions that separated them from worshiping their God. They had made decisions that had a negative imprint on their life. Now think about that. You ever made a decision that you went back and you said, man, I I wish I hadn't made that decision. I, I really wish that I hadn't accepted that job. Or I wish that I hadn't, you know, I wish that I hadn't done that. See, we all kind of fall in that category at one point in time in our life, don't we? Now, here's the other thing about the tax collectors, the second part of the tax collectors. Tax collectors, they didn't receive an income from the Roman Empire. What they did was they'd take a territory and they would buy this territory. By that, the Romans would say the taxes of this territory amounts to this amount. And the tax collectors would actually pay that tax money up front. 
And then they would go and collect the taxes from the people. Well, now, wait a minute. How did they make a living? They had to collect a little extra. And if you'll notice in the scriptures, many of those tax collectors are wealthy tax collectors, which meant they robbed their people. They were dishonest. Not only did they make the decision that, that, that made them an outcast, that separated them from worshiping their God, but they made a decision to sin against God by treating others unfairly, by putting self ahead of neighbor, self ahead of God. Anybody ever been in that situation? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't worry about it. Okay, because I think we all could, right? Now, that's the tax collector. Okay, what about the sinners? What about the sinners? Well, they fall into two categories as well. During the biblical times, a person who broke the law of Moses, who, who, who broke the ten, one of the Ten Commandments, was considered a sinner, right? Now, you do know that the Pharisees added on to the laws of Moses, and they created, like I don't know, five, several hundred laws, okay? So they made it real difficult for a person not to, to sin, okay? But there was another category of sinners. That were those who struggled with other problems. It may have been physical problems. Did you know that the blind person was considered a sinner? Did you know that the lame person was considered a sinner? Did you know that the person that, that, that was having a rough time in Life was considered a sinner. Jesus' own disciples were walking along, and they see a blind man, and they look to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, who sinned? Tell us. Let us know. Was it his parents, or was it him who committed the sin because he was blind? So the other category of sinners was anybody that didn't have a perfect life. The righteous were those who were seen as being blessed by God. Everything in their life was going well. They were wealthy. They had herds. Uh, go back to the book of Job and read the very first of the beginning that describes Job. And he was seen as righteous. As I said, Jesus dealt with that group that they called disorder in their life. So when the religious leaders accuse Jesus of eating with sinners, Jesus' response is, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, folks, have you ever been lost? Lost. I mean, have you ever been going somewhere and you said, man, I'm lost? Yeah. Or, 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 maybe, or maybe you got a result from the doctor and it throws you into a state of being lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I don't know how I'm going to how I'm going to endure this this I don't know. Lost. Or or maybe 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 spiritually you said I'm just a, a lost place. Or maybe even mentally you said, you know, I, I'm struggling with depression or or something else in your life that has you down and you feel lost. Well, let me tell you something. There's hope for you because Jesus says, I've come for you. I've come for you. You're the ones that I've come for. I've come to bring you hope. That you can take your life from here and you can reorder your life to a new way, a new life. Yes. Now I want to begin. Let's look at the let's look at some scripture references. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. And here's what the scripture says. It says that Jesus was walking along. And he saw a man who was called Matthew, okay? And Matthew was sitting at the tax booth, doing what he's supposed to, collecting taxes. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. You see, Matthew is that person who made the decision on his own to go and look out for himself. I'm going to take care of myself. I don't care what anybody thinks. This is what I'm going to I'm going to side with the Romans. And, and Matthew also said, I'm going to make my living 
by stealing from the others. I'm going to sin. I'm going to put myself before anybody else and before God. That's his decision that he made. Okay? He's not allowed to worship in the temple. And those choices that he made, if you look at the tax collector, it sowed his life from order to disorder. Nobody wanted to be around him. Nobody wanted to eat meal with him. And he wasn't welcome. He was separated from people. And Jesus says, Matthew, follow me. What's Matthew offering? He's offering hope. He's offering hope that, Matthew, listen, you follow me because what? I can change all this about. I can make a change in your life. Yeah. So the choice then lies in Matthew's hands. Jesus says, follow me. And it's up to Matthew whether he decides to follow him or not. Now, we know by the scriptures he becomes his disciple, so we know he follows Jesus. Okay? That choice for a change in your life and my life lies in each one of us. Okay? But we're not through here. Let's go. Matthew goes to dinner. And as he sat at the dinner in the house, many of the tax collectors and sinners came, and they were sitting with him and his disciples. <clears throat> Folks, I cannot help but believe that what happened was others saw Matthew and saw, man, Jesus is eating with this man. And, and they took it and looked at the life of, of Matthew, and they said, maybe there's hope for me. Is that not what you're here today for? That Jesus might bring you a little bit of hope that you can face tomorrow or maybe this afternoon? And that's what they came. They came to, to, to Matthew's and they sat there because they thought this is somebody who might be able to bring hope for our lives. Jesus says in John 8, he says, I'm the light of the world, which could be easily translated as hope. So now let's finish up here with Matthew. The scripture says that when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? Okay, but when he heard this, Jesus, he said, those who are well have no need for a, of a physician, but those who are sick. You know, the Pharisees, they didn't see no need. Why didn't they accept Jesus? They didn't need Jesus. They had it all down pat. All they needed to do was, you know, throw up a few prayers in the temple and, and offer a few sacrifices to the priest, and they were good to go. They didn't need to see it that they needed to change within themselves. So they didn't need no Jesus. In the eyes of all those around them, they were righteous. They were well. Everybody else that was sick, and lo and behold, that's who Jesus says, I've come for. I've come for the sick. John the Baptist called this bunch of uh, Pharisees that thought they were righteous. He said, you brood of vipers. That's what he said, yeah. He said, he said, listen, and Jesus says in that passage, continuing in Matthew, he says, listen, go and learn what this means. And then he tells them, here's what I want you to go learn. I desire mercy. Not sacrifice, for I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinner. Go and learn what that means. Do you think I care if you go and sacrifice on the altar and then you go live your life the way you want to? Do you think I care if you pray that you, you, you thank God that you're not like, you know, that, that tax collector? Mercy, mercy. Go and learn what it means. You know, I've said from the beginning many times in my passages, you know, people have a misunderstanding of God. God does not condemn anybody to hell. There is a hell and there is a heaven. <coughs> people don't hear that. And God doesn't condemn anybody to hell. But if you choose that you don't want to have anything to do with God, well, you've condemned yourself. Exactly. Exactly, okay? That's a choice you make. The tax collectors of Jesus' time, Matthew, he recognized that the decisions that he made for his life were the wrong decisions, and those decisions had thrown his life into disorder, 
and he couldn't he couldn't escape the consequences of his decision. You can't escape the consequences of your decision. But let me tell you something. Jesus comes along and says, I can change that. I can't put you back to the old way, but I can promise you a new way, a reorder, a new life, if you will follow me. And Matthew had to make that decision like we do. There's another story about Zacchaeus. You know Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Remember that story? Do they sing that in our children's? I hope so. But anyway, Zacchaeus is up a tree. Okay? And Jesus comes along and says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come out of that tree. He said, because I've got to have dinner with you. Now, I, I, I imagine that Zacchaeus almost fell out of that tree because nobody wanted to eat with a tax collector, especially a crooked tax collector. And Zacchaeus was known as a crooked tax collector. Yeah. But let me remind you the definition of hope. Hope is choosing to believe and act as if the future will be better than the present. What does Zacchaeus do? Well, Zacchaeus comes down out of that tree. Okay? He comes out of that tree because Jesus has offered him hope. Now listen to what Zacchaeus says. Zacchaeus, he stood there for a minute, and he said, Lord, he said, Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I'm going to give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. Wow. I told you, act to make the future better. Zacchaeus not only repents or changes his ways, but he seeks to make amends of his ways. If you go back to the beginning when John was out baptizing people in the River Jordan, he told the, he told the uh, Pharisees, he called them a brood of vipers, and what he told them was, he said, listen to me, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Don't just say you repent, but bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do you think Zacchaeus bore fruit worthy of repentance? Give away half of his possessions and, and, and four times anybody's harmed him? His actions bore fruit. His life was restored or reordered by Jesus. He was given new hope, a new lease on life. And for the rest of the story, let's go to it. And it says, <coughs> it says this, Jesus says to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Today salvation has come to this house. Why? Because he too was a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. How many times does Jesus have to say it? But did you notice about salvation? When did salvation come about? Sometimes we get it all wrong. Sometimes we think we want salvation and then we will repent. All right? But Zacchaeus, what did Zacchaeus do? He confessed. He repented. Amend. And he was granted salvation. Salvation came to him. Salvation came because he chose it. Salvation's a free gift from God. He says, it, it, Jesus Christ died on the cross for every one of us, offering us free gift. But you've got to receive it. You've got to choose to receive that which he's offering to you. And hope is believing such that you are willing to make it happen. Not my words. Look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 4. It says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. Jesus is not condemning us. He's offering us an invitation to a new way. To reorder our lives. To take this disorder that we're dealing with and reorder our lives. Okay? Repent means going a, a different direction means to shift the focus from self back to God. <clears throat> Our heart begins to, to be more like Jesus when we repent and we recognize the need of our neighbor such that we begin to love our neighbor as we would oneself. The change is Christ working in our lives to reorder our lives. Or you might say reprioritize. Those who knew Matthew or Zacchaeus and there's others, 
and I can't get into it too long. How about the woman at the well? You remember that story, the woman at the well? She goes into the city, and she starts telling everybody about this man who knows all about her, but yet still loves her. And they left the city, many's left the city, and they believed because of her words, and others went because they believed when they met Jesus. Because her life was changed, because Matthew's life was changed, and Zacchaeus' life, an adulterous woman was offered new hope after an encounter with Jesus. Now, I'm certain uh, that they knew that their lives had changed because they weren't the same people as they were before. That is the hope that Jesus is offering to you and to me. Hope that in Christ, your life can and will be better. Over and over again in the Gospels, we see this. Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers forgiveness to the people. Not in the condemning way. He don't throw your sins up in your face. He does it with grace. Remember the woman at the well? He says, go call your husband. He didn't look at her and point his finger and say, you don't even have a husband. You've had five husbands. No, he says, go call your husband. And she's the one that says, I've had five husbands. Yeah, go back and read the story. Okay? Jesus doesn't condemn us. So now let's look at the sinner very quickly, okay? Let's look at the sinner. Paul wrote that God uh, proved his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I shared with you at the time of Jesus that those, those, um, a sinner was one who broke the law of Moses, okay? Now one of those laws is called adultery, okay? And I won't get into that. You can read about it. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus is confronted by this woman who's actually caught in the very act. That's what the Scripture says. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, it's commanded us to stone this woman. What do you say, Jesus? What do you say, Jesus? Well, she's broken the law. Throw the book at her. Condemn her. Anybody out there want to say and hold their hand up and say they've never brought, broken one of the Ten Commandments? I, I don't think any of us would say that. We can't do it, can we? We all. And you know what the consequences of sin is? It says in the Scriptures, the consequences of sin is death. Yeah. So when they kept on questioning him, questioning Jesus, he straightened up and he said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Hit them right between the eyes. Never throw a little pebble. He said, look, examine your life. Look into your life. If you don't think you've ever created any problem, then you go ahead and throw the stone. You see, like her accusers, we, we truly, when we begin to examine ourselves and look at ourselves, what do we find? We are all sinners. And we're all unworthy of God's love. It's not about our worth. It's about God's love. That's the hope that he gives through Jesus. And when they'd all left, Jesus says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No, sir. And Jesus says, Neither do I. Go your way. And from now on, do not sin again. Hope. That's what Jesus gave her. Neither do I. Can you imagine her? I, I, I see her squatting. This is the way I see her. And, and she's not even looking at Jesus. And, 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 and Jesus says, where's your accusers? And she says, well, they're all gone. And she, he says, neither do I. Wow, I, a new lease on life. That's what he gave to her. Listen, that's what Jesus offers to every one of us. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is what he offers. All have sinned. And you can count on it. You can put your faith in it. You can trust it. And you can believe it. That he'll forgive you whatever. And he's going to offer to you a new way. A new life. A reordered life. Go and sin no more. Now you have to choose. And we're human beings. We continually mess up. So we have to continue to go back and say, Lord, forgive me. We have to ask for that forgiveness. But he continues to forgive and forgive and forgive. 
He told Peter about that, didn't he? See, Jesus looked not on the outward appearance of people, but he looked into their heart. He saw beyond the outward into the heart. And if you remember at the time of creation, God created, and then his next words, it is good. He pronounced it good. So what he did is he, he created Kelly, and he said, Kelly, you are good. And he said, Kelly, you're good. And he created every one of us, and he said, you are good. But what happened? You see, the evil that lives within us, that exists within us, is that which we choose, we allow to exist in us. The bad. That's what Paul says, I try, but I can't do it on my own. I continue to fail. And Christ says, listen, I'm going to offer you some hope that no matter how messed up it is, I can change that. I can reorder that. A new life. Your relationship may not be renewed. Your finances may not be restored. Your health may continue to fail. Okay? You, you, You may have to come face to face with the consequences or the choices that you made. But listen to me. Hold on because you know what? Your life will be forever changed. I promise you that. I don't promise you. God promises you that. Jesus wants to reorder your life. God is a God of second, third, and fourth, and fifth chances. He's an all-forgiving God. Now, as I shared earlier, there's another another category of sinner in the the biblical times, and that was those who struggled with physical illnesses, mental illnesses, spiritual illnesses. When bad things happened to good people, they were considered a sinner. Go back and look at the Scriptures. They were all lumped in there together as a sinner. What did they tell Job? When he lost everything, Job, you sinned against God. You've got an unconfessed sin, Job. That's why, that's why all these things are happening to you. Yeah. The idea at that time was if you're a righteous person, you were somebody who was blessed. But if you had any kind of unconfessed sins, then your life was in disorder. Okay? Now, today we, we recognize that this is not a true statement. We recognize there are people who, who have physical ailments. We recognize there, there are people who have, who have mental struggles and can continue to live a good life. We recognize this. We recognize that we are not immune to the way of the world, which is pain and suffering. We recognize there's health issues and even death that throws our life into disorder. But there's hope for us. And that hope comes in the name of Jesus. Jesus and the disciples are leaving Jericho, and as they're traveling away, they encounter this blind man whose name is Bartimaeus. And and, and Bartimaeus is there, and he continues to cry out to Jesus. Okay, he cries out, and the the crowd says, Listen to what? You be quiet. Nobody wants to hear you. You, you're, You're a sinner. Be quiet. Nobody wants to hear you. And Jesus stopped and says, What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And the blind says, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, said, go. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and he followed him on the way. Wow. Bartimaeus wouldn't be quiet. He wasn't going to be silent. He continued to cry out to Jesus to respond. He didn't know his life was going to be changed, but he knew who, knew who could change his life, and that was Jesus. So he continues to cry out. What I want you to know is Jesus hears your cry. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're dealing with, continue to cry out to Jesus. Cry out. He knows your pain, and he'll not pass you by. That's what that passage is about. He's not going to pass you by. Now, he may not restore you in the way or heal you in the way that you expect, okay? But he will bring a reorder to your life, okay? Another story is a woman in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, this woman has suffered for years. She spent every dime she had on every kind of cure that she could find with no avail. And she heard about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. 
in both of these stories, these people, they didn't wait. They didn't wait. They cried out to Jesus. They sought Jesus because they knew that, that this man, they had the hope that Jesus could change their lives. That's what they're intended to do. Now, when I tell these stories, a lot of people say, wait a minute, preacher, I want to tell you something, buddy. I've been praying for you and my son or my daughter or even myself. I've not been healed. Don't stand up there and say that. Listen, let me tell you something, folks. In the scriptures, you have a small number of people that's been healed by Jesus' hand, miraculously healed, in comparison to all those in the world that were blind, that were lame, that had leprosy, that loved ones died. You see, there's still miraculous healing. I still believe in miraculous healing, okay? But I also have to trust the healing to the hands of God and trust, however it works out, it's in God's hands. And I have to trust that, that God knows. But God can take my situation, my disorder, and he can reorder it in a new way, a new light. We have to understand that. The stories in the Bible about this healing, what are they for? They're for us to understand, to put our faith and our trust in God. A God who understands your situation, understand your struggle, and wants to provide you hope through Jesus, hope that whatever you face today, that there's a better day. The scripture, go back and look at Revelation, what it says, behold, he says, I'm going to wipe every tear from your eyes, there'll be no more sorrow, no more pain, no suffering, behold, I've made all things new. Hold on to that. It's going to come about. I don't know when. And I know over the last couple of years, we've all had our lives thrown into various states of disorder. You can't say you hadn't as a result of this pandemic. And the world we live in, we've lost loved ones. You've lost friends and, and, and loved ones to this, this COVID that you expected it would have, I don't know, 10, 15 more years of life. And yet their life was cut short. You've, lost, you've seen that you've had to, I, I don't know if you've had to see on, on iPads or things because you couldn't go into the hospital to visit these people to say goodbye. Jobs have been lost. In the world that we live in, fear of, of war continues to escalate. Fear of, 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 of a nuclear war is on the horizon. Closer home, we have people who are, who are, are doing their own shopping. All they're doing is grocery shopping. And somebody comes in and takes their life from them unexpectedly. Just down the road, we, we hear every day you pick up the paper, you hear of a drive-by shooting where some child has been shot and killed or a mother or, 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 or a father has been shot and killed for no reason. We see it all around us. The rising cost of homes prevent many from finding affordable housing. Shortages of food and, and, and baby formula. And all this creates anxiety and fear within us. It wells up in us. Where is the hope? The world don't know hope. But Jesus says this. He says, come to me. Come to me. All that are weary. He's talking to us and are carrying heavy burdens. And he says, I will give you rest. When you reach that time in your life, when, when, when life has you down, when that fear and anxiety has welled up into you, that you're boiling over, and you don't know where to turn, turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. You say, now how can I turn to Jesus? He's at the right hand of the Father. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. Call somebody. Call me. It's night or day. My phone's on 24-7. And I'll come pray with you. I'll walk with you. Jesus says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. He's telling us, 
don't put your hope on these things of Israel, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Those things won't give you true hope. Jesus tells us, he says, beware of false prophets, those that tell you, oh, if you do this, everything will be well. Don't put your trust in man. Put your trust in God. Jesus says, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. You know how you store up things in heaven? You do that by doing the things that pleases God. And what are those? Those acts of kindness. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Gentleness. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can't fool God. But he says, that choice is up to you. It's completely up to you. And you say, well, well how do we do this? How does, how does Jesus work in the world? And I'm getting close to the end, so hang with me. Jesus says, listen, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or your body, what you wear. Don't worry about that. He says, listen. He says, go to the next verse. He says, is life not more than food? Is body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, ne- they, neither, they neither sow nor they weep. They don't gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to the span of your life? Put your trust in God. Put your trust in God. See, it's not about sitting around doing nothing and waiting for a better day. Or waiting for God to provide for you like he's some kind of servant. Worry does not no harm. We must, we must make a difference. And be a difference. And Jesus tells us how we can make that difference. You see, there's a scripture in the passage, and he brings it together, and he says, Verily, truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. Now, people read that, and they say, well, wait a minute here. Preacher, you can't, ha- you can't, you can't give a lame person... The ability to walk. No, I cannot. I don't have that healing. That's God's hand. He has that healing. Then how can you stand there and say that we can do greater works than these? Well, folks, let me tell you something. At the time of Jesus, they were drawn to him because they knew that Jesus could provide hope for their life, that he could change their life, okay, make a difference in their life. Now, Jesus expects those of us whose hope is in Christ to be the hands and feet of Christ. We are to bring the hope of Christ into the world. We are to be the hands and feet of Christ. When Jesus walked on the earth, uh, the incarnate God, he fed the people, both physically and spiritually. And and you know the story that he told about this, uh, uh, the feeding of the people, the five barley loaves and two fishes. Then listen to what he says. He says, I just read that, didn't I? He says, you can do greater works than these, okay? So, So we who are called to be the hands and feet of Christ are to do those things. We're to offer those things. But you cannot offer something that you don't have. Folks, the world does not have the hope that we need. The hope is not in this world. That's a false hope. Hope comes in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you have Christ in your life, then you have his hope in you. And if you have his hope in you, then we as Christians are called to share that hope. How do we do that? A blessing box up here. Fill that blessing box. Rise against hunger. $2,500? This church can do more than $2,500. And for every dollar that we spend, we can pick, pack another meal. What can we do? What kind of difference? Love Denver? What can we do to show this community that we love them? There's so much that we can do to give people the hope. The other day, Beth and I were walking our dogs, and we were walking our dogs around the block, and there's a, there's a blessing box on the corner. 
of our neighborhood. And as we was walking along, this lady was walking along with her backpack, and she walked up to the black blessing box, and she opened the b blessing box up. And she closed it back up. And she walked on her way. There was nothing in that blessing box. You know, we can either be the hands and feet of Christ and, and, and show others that there is hope, that we hear you crying, we see your struggles, and we're going to reach out because Christ reached out to us in our times of struggle. Are we can reach out to others? That's our decision. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, we give you thanks for this time that we've had together. We pray that your presence be with us. We know, Lord, that we have failed you in so many ways, but you continue to forgive us. You continue to, to impress upon us to, to do your will. Lord, we are here today. And Lord, the, the world needs to, to know that there's hope. And the only way the world will know that there's hope is if, if we show that the, they can put their hope in Christ the one who is our rock, the one who is our foundation. Lord, we thank you for this. Pray that you be with us this week. We pray this name of Christ. What if I live like the devil is a liar? What if I live like God is all true? Not focusing on my selfish desires, but voices in my head from my youth. He is all that I will ever need. What if I sing like the devil is a liar? What if I worship the God of all truth? I am joining in with that heavenly choir. Let the praises ring, I'll sing with you. I lift my hands and surrender to the Father. He's the author and perfecter of my faith. He is the way, the truth, the life. I will always testify. He is all that I will ever need. all that I need. My God shines a light in the dark places of my soul. He's the only one to heal and make my spirit whole. Oh, I've been held captive in this place for far too long. His truth sets me free, and I worship with my song. I lift my hands and surrender to the Father. To the Father. He's the author and 
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever.